Well, good morning. Um, so a lot of times when I get up here to speak, uh, I feel like God has, has given me uh, like a powerful revelation of what he wants me to speak about. <clears throat> That's not happening this morning. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, so, you know, we're going through Psalms and uh, it's, there's 150 of them. And it's like, how do you narrow that down and pick one Psalm, right? And so uh, I'm, I was wrestling with that for a couple of days, and or, well, I didn't have a whole lot of days to do that with, but I was going through and I wrote out this list, and, and, and every time I find a psalm that it's like, oh, that, that's a preachable psalm, I'd write it down. I have a list, and I only got halfway through the psalms, and I have a list of 13 different psalms that I'd like to preach out of. <laughs> so it's like, okay, how do I narrow that down? You know? So uh, anyway, and, and while I'm doing this, a song started going through my head, uh, a song from my, my days past. When I was in college, I attended a, a uh, Church of Christ over near DU, uh, University Church of Christ. And uh, they, they don't use musical instruments, and they sing all of their music a cappella. And, uh, and, it, and it can be really beautiful, really beautiful. But one of the songs that they used to sing was, uh, and I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to say it to you. Uh, <laughs> it's, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Let me not be ashamed and let not my enemies triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Three times, remember not. I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed and let not my enemies triumph over me. And it's like this song kept going through my head. And so uh, that is Psalm 25. And so I thought, okay, that's where I'm going to go. So that's what you're going to hear today. <clears throat> so let me pray and we'll get started on this. So Father, we just, uh, we just lift up uh, this time this morning, Lord. We pray that, that you would take your word and you would make it alive to people that you would speak to the hearts of everybody here today, Lord, that, that you would have impact. So use my mouth, Lord, use my words to bring glory and honor to yourself in all of this. Amen. Uh, so I've done a couple of things, and I kind of want to explain a little bit why I've done what I've done. Uh, I have the whole psalm on slides. It's only 22 verses. Um, However, it's not in an edition that you will ever find. Well, you may not find. Um, it's, it's actually out of a Jewish translation. Okay, so a Messianic Jew uh, who uh, translated the whole Bible wrote a, it's a Bible. So it's a Bible translation, but it's, it's literally written from a Jewish perspective, which I love because it, 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 it uh, talks about things from, from a Jewish perspective. And, and it's like, if you want to understand what's being said, then what is being said is, is based on the words that are being used. And so it's a, based on a Jewish understanding of those words. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that to you uh, this morning. So when I asked the Lord, uh, okay, Lord, what's, what's the message out of this? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm expecting some great revelation, and I, I don't hear a great revelation. All I hear God say is, teach them how you study. I'm like, What? And he said it again, teach them how you study. Show them how you study the passages. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to do that. So because he told me to do that, I am going to do that. So we're going to look at the passage, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what David was saying and then what it means to us today. and What can we learn from it? Because that's how I look at Scripture. When I'm going through Scripture, I, I tend to want to, I want to know what it said what the author was trying to say when they wrote it, but how does that apply to me now as well? That's just as important. Uh, so the first verse, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn there because what you see on the screen is not what you will see in your scripture. So I want you to be able to get both because that's kind of important. Um, Psalm 25. And it says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. This is what it, the Jewish translation is. 
I lift up my inner being to you, Adonai. I trust you, my God. Don't let me be disgraced. Don't let my enemies gloat over me. No one waiting for you will be disgraced. Disgrace awaits those who break faith for no reason. First three verses. So what's David saying? So one of the things I want you to know is that David has sort of four themes or topics that he's going through in here. So as we go, you'll, I hope that you will hear them. Uh, the first one is that he's pleading for God's protection and that his enemies would not be allowed to, to triumph and disgrace him. And those are, uh, you would see those in verses 1 through 3 and then 15 through 22. Okay, so that's the theme of those verses. The second one is, is that David uh, is asking for guidance from Adonai and that Adonai would lead him in a correct path. Okay, leading him in the way to live. And that's uh, in verses 4 through 5 and 8 through 10. Uh, now, this is important because you're going to see these themes, and, and sometimes it's like um, it almost feels like it kind of jumps around a little bit, and it, and it does, but it all comes back together. The third topic that he's talking about is his petition for forgiveness, and he talks about that in two places, uh, 6 through 7 and verse 11. And then fourth, David acknowledges prosperity. Um, that those who fear Adonai will be um, blessed. And, and that's in 12 through 14. Uh, so those are kind of the, the main topics of this section. And so I hope that you will hear those as we go. Uh, one of the other things I want you to know before we get too far into this is that this, this psalm is actually an acrostic. Now, I don't know if you know what an acrostic is. An acrostic is a, a song or a psalm, a poem that it literally is, uh, each stanza or each line is begun with an, a letter of the alphabet and it's in order. So letter A, letter B, next stanza C, D, and that's the way it flows. Now this isn't a complete true acrostic and there's a couple of places where David deviated from that. But for the most part, it, it, that's the way it goes. Each stanza is, is begun with a different Hebrew uh, letter. Uh, now, why does that, what does that matter? Well, what that matters is that sometimes the sentence construction and how things are written uh, have to fit into the acrostic. So it sounds a little kind of odd, um, but that's okay. Um, you know, like even the first one, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. He could have just said, O Lord, I lift up my soul, but he, he needed to start with a certain letter, so he added the to you. Um, anyway, so those are the things that you kind of want to know about this psalm before we get too deep into it. So first verse, and this is, this is literally how I do Bible study. So this is what you're going to see. This is how I go through and, and what I do. Um, first verse, David is exposing his very essence, his personality, his desire. He's saying, I lift up my soul to you, Lord. Now, you know that, that we are made up of our physical body, our spirit, and our soul. The soul is all of our, our personality, our will, our feelings. It's all... That, that makes up the essence of, of who we are. And, and David is saying, I lift it up. I lift up my very being before you, Lord. And that's where uh, the Jewish translation, I lift up my inner being, lift up who I am. And it's not just a lifting up to just say, hey, God, here I am. It's a lifting up to, to God to say, look at my soul, Lord. Examine me. Okay. So David, is, David really is asking God to examine his soul. Uh, and, and in many ways, David is saying, I'm giving it to you, Lord. Verse 2, David is declaring his complete trust in God. I trust my God. Don't let me be disgraced. Don't let my enemies gloat over me. Okay, I trust you, God. I trust you. Now, David is saying he has complete trust that he has given his life over to God. He's given God the opportunity to have complete control over his life. When he's saying, I trust, that means he, is, he literally has, has given him permission to do whatever. Um, uh, let's see, that, that, that's giving over trust in, in all of his weaknesses and all his vulnerabilities, um, but it's also giving over his reputation. I trust God with my reputation. And the truth is, is that God is the holder of our reputations. And sometimes it doesn't matter what the world says or what other people say about who we are. It's about what God says. Uh, and and we've got to hold on to that. We've got to believe that. 
And verse three, David makes a declaration. There is no one who waits on the Lord um, uh, that will be ashamed. Now that term wait in the Hebrew has a, a different connotation and certain Bibles actually translate that as hope. Okay, so you'll see in some versions wait, some versions will have hope, uh, but it's the same word. And that's exactly what, what David is saying. I wait hoping in the Lord. Okay, so David's waiting with expectation of hope in the Lord that the Lord will not cause him shame um, or disgrace him or cause him disgrace in any way. Uh, and then he goes on to say that disgrace waits for those who violate God's covenant. God, God's going to allow disgrace to come to those who violate his covenant for no reason, as, as the Jewish writer indicates. So what do I learn from this passage? This is where I stop. I've gone through a couple of verses who are clearly connected. They're together. And so I look at what, it, what David was trying to say, I, and I pull that all out. And then I look at, okay, what does it say to me? And so um, these are my thoughts. And uh, I hope that, the, that you get the same thing, but you might not. God might be showing you something and revealing something to you that's very different, and that is okay. Um, but I choose to, and this is what I've learned, I've choose to reveal myself, all of my weaknesses, all of my insecurities, my pride, my selfishness, my plans, my goals in life, I choose to lift them up before the Lord. Okay, that, that's what I learned from this when David says, you know, I lift up my soul to you. I'm choosing to give all that I am, my success in life, my riches in life, um, everything. I choose to give it into the hands of the Lord. And I trust that he will be faithful with it. As David says, in you, my Lord, I trust. I trust that God will handle me well, faithfully. But I'm holding myself up also for God's examination. I'm holding myself up, even as David did, to say, God, look at me. Look at my inner being. Now, in another psalm, we know David says, you know, look and, and um, see what is wrong in me, Lord, and, and clean me out. Uh, and that's awesome. Uh, he doesn't say it in this particular passage, but that's okay. Because, in a sense, that's exactly what he's asking God to do, is to look at his very being, his, his purposes in life, his goals, his actions. You know, are they pleasing to God? And if not, is, he's giving God complete uh, permission to do whatever he needs to do with him. Um, and I can declare my complete trust in God. And I've, uh, because of things in my life I've, had to, I've gone through, uh, there are times when I have to say, God, I have no... Uh, power or authority or anything to make something happen. I trust you. I have to trust you. When I was losing my eyesight and I had no hope of a future, literally I had no hope of a future, I had to be able to say, God, I trust you with my future. I trust what you're going to do with me. And he's never disappointed. And even David declared, all who wait and hope on the Lord will not be disappointed, will not be ashamed. Okay? If we're hoping in the Lord, if we're waiting on the Lord, he is not going to shame us. That doesn't mean he may not correct us along the way, because he will. He probably will help us become better as we learn to live his ways. Um, but he's not going to shame us. That's the enemy. That's what the world does. Uh, God never shames us. Um, but those who break faith, those who don't live according to God's covenant, they will be shamed. Maybe not in this life, but in the next when they have to face the Lord in judgment. Okay, so that's, that's the first section. Let's go on to the second section. Verse 4. This is, this, these, the English version I'm reading is out of the uh, New King James. Verse 4. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. And according to your mercy, remember me for your goodness' sake, Lord. Wow. What's David saying? David's asking the Lord to show him 
his ways. Show me your ways, O Lord. Think about that. And David's not asking just to, to, to show, um, you know, just what's good for today. He's literally asking God to show his ways to life, to ways that God wants him to live. And David is, is saying, you know, you are the righteous God. You're the one who can show me how to live righteously. In the Jewish translation, make me, make no, make me know your ways, Adonai. Teach me your paths. In, in David's mind, the path is the way of life, the way I'm supposed to go with my life. So think about that. That's this path that I am treading on. And he's saying, God, show me your path. Show me how you want me to live. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. My hope is in you all day long. All day long. Again, David is saying, guide me, God. Guide me in your paths. Guide me in your truth. For you are the God who saves. David recognized that God is the God of salvation. Now, we know that, and that's a term we use a lot in regards to our God, that he is a God of salvation. It was less popular of a term in David's time. He recognized that God saves. Uh, But then he goes on to say, my hope is in you all day long. Nothing through the day is going to distract me from my hope in you. Nothing is going to keep me from waiting on you and hoping in you, Lord. Remember your compassion and grace, Adonai, for these are ages old. He's asking God to remember <laughs> how God's going to remember. God's not going to forget his tender mercies and his, his grace. Um, but David goes on to say, I recognize that your grace and your mercy are from old, for ages, that have always been there. Don't remember my youthful sins of transgressions, but remember me according to your grace for the sake of your goodness, Adonai. David's saying, forget my youthful sins, forget the sins of my past, Lord, but remember me as your grace allows you to see me, as your mercy allows you to see me. So in these verses, it becomes clear that we should, we should be seeking God. Here David says, says, make known your past to me, Lord. Make known. So we should be seeking God, and we should be asking him to teach us his ways, to teach us how to live in this world, I want to know God's ways. I want to know his path of righteous living. I want to know what part of my life is not going the right way so that I can change it to go the right way with the Lord. Okay? And and I need to know that. And so this is the cry of my heart as well as David's. He was crying out, Lord, I want to live your way. I don't want to live the way that's expected of me. I don't want to live the way the world says I should. I want to live the way that you want me to live. And that should be the cry of all of our hearts. That we should all be crying out with God to God and saying, God, teach us your ways that we might live according to your righteousness, according to your righteous path. And and one thing that I see in this is that David, I think David recognizes that living the righteous life the way God wants him to live keeps him from sin. And we we forget that. But there is a, there is, Uh, this aspect of the way we live our lives that either opens us up more to sin or it helps us to stay away from sin. Living according to God's way helps us to stay away from sin. Um, And then not living God's way will lead to sin and to breaking that faith that he had referred to earlier. Um, He also recognized that we, uh, we will be held accountable. David recognized that, that at some point we're going to be held accountable for the way we live. And Uh, So the question that I have for you right now and that I have for me all the time is, Lord, how am I living right now? Is it pleasing to you or is it not? If it's not, help me to make it right. How often do we question whether God is punishing us or God has forgotten us? Sometimes we we think those things when life isn't going the way we want them to go or the way we think that it should we can often think that God maybe is punishing us. And the truth is, is maybe God is just trying to correct us and move us to the right path. We expect punishment and we expect this harsh God. And yet David says that 
you know, you are a God of mercy and tenderness and faithfulness and grace. And yet all we can think about sometimes is a God of punishment and anger and judgment. And that's not our God at all. That's not our God at all. We must come to recognize that we need the Lord to guide us uh, in the paths of righteousness, um, but that we also must repent from our sins. Even as David says, don't remember the sins of my youth, but remember me from your grace. Then we can know without doubt that for his sake and for his goodness, uh, he was going to act towards us in a, in a right and gracious manner. Okay? He's going to act towards us in a, in a right and gracious manner. This is what David is trying to say. This is what I'm hearing David say. So verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice. And the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. To such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. David declares that God is good and fair, and that he's teaching sinners the right way to live. It's that first verse there. Adonai is good and he is fair. And this is why he teaches sinners the way to live. Right? God is constantly trying to teach us who have been sinners how to live a right life. David David totally acknowledges that. He acknowledges God's goodness. And he goes on that, to say that he leads the humble to do what is right, and he teaches the humble. And we talk of, we've talked about pride, and we've talked about humility before, but we've got to recognize that, that humbleness is, is uh, an attitude as much as it is an action. It is an action, and we can act humbly, but sometimes our actions don't match up with um, our words or what's really going on in our mind. And sometimes we can act like humbleness, and, but there's a lot of pride in us. Um, but David is saying, we have to be humble. Because when we are humble, God is going to come alongside and he's going to teach us. But it's the only spot that we can actually learn from the Lord. If we're not humble, it's really hard to learn anything. David goes on in verse 10 to declare that all of God's ways are grace and truth. The NIV says, that all of God's ways are loving and faithful. Loving and faithful. For those who keep God's covenant and follow his instructions. There's that important thing. Okay? It's about those who keep God's covenant and about um, following his instructions. All Adonai's paths are grace and truth to those who keep his covenant and instructions. And for the sake of your name, Adonai, forgive my wickedness. Great though it is. Here he's talking about God's goodness and, and in the midst of it and talking about humility, he recognizes his own sinfulness. And he just cries out to God, forgive me. Forgive me for my wretchedness, for my sin. It seems that we must recognize that God's not just a harsh and judgmental God. As many today, I, I hear from non-believers when they, when they talk about God, um, it's not like they truly believe that there is a God, but they, when they do talk about a God, they talk about how harsh God is, how jud judgmental he is, how mean he is to let such and such happen, or that he didn't take care of this or do that. And, and that's the way the world sees God, as this harsh and judgmental being, um, if they acknowledge him at all. But that's not our God. And David goes on to, is saying there, God is good and he is fair. That's the way David saw him. That's the way we see him. That's the way I see him. And he's always trying to teach us, always trying to teach us how to live our lives in a right way. We must acknowledge in humbleness that God's ways are wiser than our own understanding. Um, we, we are kind of taught in this country that, you know, you can have it your way. You know, this is an old Burger King commercial, have it your way. That dates you, because that's from back in the 70s. <laughs> if you've heard that, you probably are as old as I am, or close. <clears throat> anyway, um, but, but that's the way it is. Ken mentioned um, uh, 
Frank Sinatra, you know, <laughs> I do it my way. You know, that, that's the theme of our society is that we do it our way. But in humbleness, we need to recognize that God's ways are better, that his, his understanding, his wisdom is far above anything we are capable of. And so in humbleness, I need to submit my ways to God's ways. It is only when we can uh, be humble that we can see God's justice and his truth. Okay, we, if we're not being humble, we're not going to see God's justice in his truth. And that it is only in humbleness and repentance that we will let God teach us the right way to live. If we're so convinced that how we're living our life is good, okay, uh, not a problem, and we're not humble, we're not going to allow God to teach us the right way to live. And so we'll continue living in a bad way. The, the problem that I see for a lot of uh, Christians, people who call themselves Christians, believers, and maybe they are, maybe they're not, I don't know. Um, but they live their own way and they say, that's good enough for God. I have an understanding with him. And he understands that this is just how I am. Uh, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Because he knows that's not what he made you for. He made you to live rightly, not to live your own way. And so they're lying to themselves. And the, and the longer you persist in those kinds of lies, the farther you step away from God, the farther you get away from God. And we need to recognize that his ways are grace and truth to those who keep his instructions. Okay. This book, I didn't bring my Bible today. <laughs> uh, this Bible this book is filled with instructions on how to live rightly. And we want to pick and choose. Oh, I like this, so I'm going to live this way. I'm going to like, I like this part. Well, this one doesn't really agree with me, so I'm going to ignore that one. Um, I'm, but you can't. The whole thing is either true, and we live the whole thing, or we're not really living any of it at all. And that's, that's one of the things that I, that I hear from me, is I have to live this way. I have to live according to all of what Scripture says, not one way or the other. Now, many over the centuries, many churches have split because they can get a church can get so focused on one or two verses about something and they miss some of the rest of it. This is how Calvinism and Arminianism—they're two different schools of thought in in doctrine within the church. Uh, had got started is that people camped so far on one or two verses that they missed these other verses. Well, they missed, they camped on those verses and now they're stuck here and, and there's no middle. And God is always in the middle on those kinds of things. You know, scripture sort of implies that once saved, always saved, but it also says you can lose your salvation, which is true. They're both true. The truth is in the middle is that it's incredibly difficult to lose your salvation, but you can. That's the truth. And so we need to be humble enough to let God uh, instruct us in all of those things. Verse 12. Who is the person? In the King James it says, Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show his covenant. So let me clarify that a little bit. Because David says, who is the man that fears Adonai? Who is the man who fears? Well, what is, what is he talking about? Am I supposed to be afraid of God? What David is talking about is the difference between being afraid of God and fearing God. Now, you're kind of thinking... Doesn't that sound like the same thing? It really is not. It is not. We can be afraid of God and never want to approach him. Or we can reverentially fear his holiness. Because, and I've, you've heard me say this from up here before, is God is so pure and so holy, he, uh, sin cannot come into his presence. Right? So if I am in sin, I am not going to be able to come into his presence. That's what I should fear. I should fear that I won't be able to come into God's presence. Now, at judgment when that happens, and I can't be in God's presence, which is now heaven, 
what's left for me? Hell. Right? So I have to have a reverential fear of the Lord. That means I fear his holiness and fear sinning against his holiness. I don't want to because I don't want to deal with the, the consequences of sin. So I am aware of it. I am, I am fearful of breaking God's rules and his instructions. Um, but that's not the same of just being afraid of, uh, just being afraid of God. Um, and so if you think about a passage in, in Exodus uh, where the children of Israel have come to the mountain and, and Moses is up on the mountain and he's getting the Ten Commandments, um, you know, he, God said, you know, put, a, put barriers around the bottom of the mountain because we don't want people to rush up the mountain to see me. But on the, on the mountain is thunder and lightning and storming, you know, and this is uh, just, you know, God being God. And the people are afraid. So when it comes time for them to come to the Lord, they back away in fear and trembling and say, <laughs> you know, no, that's okay. You, you go speak to God. Don't let him talk to us because we don't want to hear his voice. We're afraid. That's the difference between fear and, and uh, or being afraid and, and reverential fear is I, I want to hear God. I want to, my fear of God is that I'm sinning against him. I want to hear correction from him so that I can live the way he wants me to. That's a healthy fear. Being afraid of him and saying, God, don't speak to me. Let somebody else talk and let them pass that on to me. That's a being afraid. And that's not what David is talking about at all. He's talking about having that reverential fear of the Lord. And so when he says, um, who is the person who fears Adonai? He will teach him his ways. He answers his own question. And he says, who is the man who fears? And then he says, that man is the one that God is going to teach his ways to. He will remain prosperous and his descendants will inherit the land. There is this uh, blessing that goes along with that kind of fear of the Lord. Okay, and, and see it in David's words. He will remain prosperous. This man who fears the Lord, the Lord will teach, and he will remain prosperous and his descendants will inherit the land. There is this aspect of fearing the Lord where God is teaching you and you're accepting what he's teaching in humbleness and brokenness. That prosperity comes. Now, let's look at that for brief, real briefly because when, when we think of prosperity, we're thinking about riches. We're talking, thinking about big cars and big houses and that's not the, the Hebrew word prosperity at all. The Hebrew word prosperity, very similar to the word shalom, means that prosperity is, is in your life, that blessings happen, that things work out right, that, that you will always be taken care of, that things will be there for you. There is blessing on your life. And that's what David is talking about, prosperity, is that things will go smoothly in life. Things won't just fall apart in life. When we're not living according to the way God wants us to live, we've walked away from God's blessing, which means that we're at the mercy of the world and what the world wants to do to us. And you know what? The enemy of your soul, Satan, he's going to do everything he can to, to beat you up and destroy you. Now, um, Lisa and I have always endeavored to live this way, and, and we have seen what I would call prosperity in our lives. Even when I was laid off or fired from a position, you know, we never missed a bill. God always took care of us. You know, there was money there to pay our bills, even, even when I had been unjustly fired. Um, you know, when I started my counseling practice, I, I basically said, Lord, this is your practice. You run it the way you want to run it. And over the years, God took care of it. It always was successful. I met with some uh, other therapists at one point, uh, and the one, one gal was telling me that she spends $800 a month on advertising, and she still couldn't get enough clients to come in. And, and I'm turning away clients, and I didn't spend a penny on advertising because God is bringing them in. God's bringing clients to me and keeping me busy. That's what I'm talking about, prosperity. God takes care of those kinds of things. Um, just even like our, our uh, water heater and our heater at home, our heater blew up on us three or four times, kept blowing it. So it blew a hole in the side of our heater. We didn't know that. And so there was no 
uh, when your heater heats up, it, it heats this, the gas in this chamber. Well, there was a hole, so the gas was leaking out, which then could have blown your whole house up, right? And we lived with that for a year and a half or two years, something like that. And God took care of it. That's what David's talking about when he says prosperity, uh, that the man who fears the Lord, he will remain prosperous. God will take care of those kinds of things, you know, and keep you safe. And, you know, just kind of blows my mind sometimes just thinking about that. And then uh, verse 14, Adonai relates intimately with those who fear him. Think about that term. Adonai relates intimately. Another verse version says uh, that he tells his secrets. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Okay, th- think about that. If you don't fear God, you're not walking according to his ways and his instructions, you're also missing out the intimacy of that relationship with the Lord. And it's like, oh, you know, David just makes that so clear that, that the Lord shares his secrets with those who fear him. So, what do we see from here? There, it's clear that those who... who healthy, in a healthy way, fear the Lord, are blessed. They, they learn from the Lord. The Lord teaches his ways. They are prosperous. It, it goes on to say that their children will inherit the land. Um, so there's it, the prosperity from the man who fears the Lord is passed down to the next generation. And that the Lord is still there and involved with them. Um, and it's clear that, these, uh, that intimacy with the Lord implies close relationship because in that close relationship is where he can teach me the most. That's where I can hear the secrets of the Lord and how to live my life. If I'm not walking close to the Lord, if I'm not fearing the Lord, I'm uh, limiting what I can hear from God and what he can do in my life. That's my bad. But hear me when I say that this is, this is my experience. When David talks about that, um, this, whole, this whole section, you know, he's talking about the blessing of the Lord, that there is those who fear and God is teaching them, you know, there's prosperous, but there's blessing that flows to people in this position, okay? And, and I hope my life reflects that. Um, I'm not sure it always does because I'm not sure I'm always walking closely enough with the Lord, but, um, but it's there for the taking. If I choose to walk my own path, I am walking away from the blessing of the Lord. I am walking away from the prosperity of what God could do in my life. So if I choose my own path, what kind of a fool am I? I might think that I'm right about everything. And here's where our arrogance comes in. And many of us think this, most of us at at times think that this, that we're right, that we know the best thing for how to do things and how to live our lives. And that is arrogant because we don't. Doesn't the God who created us know how we should be more than how we are? It's like saying to my hammer, you know, you can't, you can decide how you're going to be used as a tool. Well, it doesn't work so well if you need a screw to screw in. It doesn't work so well if you need to untighten the nut on a, on a pipe, Right? The hammer is to be used as in, in a very specific way, as a specific tool. I am the same way. God has plans for me. Moving on. Verse 15. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are, have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain. And forgive my sins. David says that his eyes are always directed toward Adonai. Because he will save us from the traps of life. Look at that. For he will free my feet from the net. The trap. He is asking God to take notice of him and his situation. Because he's feeling alone and oppressed. And the things that that have troubled his heart have multiplied So he's asking God to free him from his distress. And again, David is asking God to look at his afflictions and his suffering 
and he acknowledges that these are due to his own sin and asks God to forgive him. There is that aspect that, of the Old Testament where, where they truly believe that all problems, all afflictions, uh, sicknesses, um, failures in life were, were because we were in sin. If you look at the book of Job, that's a lot of what's in there. But the truth is that it's not, not necessarily the case. Now, God doesn't necessarily punish us, but he does allow the consequences of our sin to afflict us, cause us problems. So we must see that even as David declares that he is keeping his eyes on the Lord, um, that he will pluck David from those traps. This is what God does for us too. As we keep our eyes on the Lord, the enemy is constantly putting traps out for us to sin. Traps that will take us down and eventually destroy us. And, but my keeping my eyes on the Lord, I can avoid these traps. I'm not stepping into the traps that the enemy has laid. And I acknowledge that, that God is protecting me from those snares. I need to acknowledge that he is doing so. And when we are um, feeling alone and oppressed, and that, that happens a lot. This world is coming against us. Nothing seems to be going right. And we're feeling down. Um, you know, we can get stuck in that. And even as David says, you know, it's growing. You know, the troubles of my heart are growing and growing. And he cries out to God, bring me out of my distress. Now, I can get so focused on my troubles that, that they do grow. As I focus and, and dwell on my problems and all the things that are going wrong, it just gets worse. They grow. They get worse. And David is saying, I keep my eyes on you, Lord. Help me out of my distress. And as long as David is keeping his eyes, and as long as I'm keeping my eyes on the Lord, I don't have to worry about those things. I don't have to focus on them because God's there. and He's going to help me get through it and take care of it. Now, I can, I can get stuck in all of that and, and then leads to depression, it leads to anxiety. Um, but he's, he's saying to God, bring me out of this distress. If I lay my problems before the Lord and I truly trust that he's going to deal with them and I walk away and leave them, that is, that is the very thing that David is talking about, letting God deal with it and taking me out of the distress, taking me out of it. But I got to put it before him and I got to leave it there. Now, when I continue to dwell on it, I am not doing that. I am struggling with my own issues, my own problems, and they're making things worse. But even as David recognized, I recognize as well that much of his trouble is due to his own sin. And like I said, I, didn't, I don't think he thinks that the Lord is necessarily punishing him, but he does recognize that there are consequences. And God does not protect us from the consequences from our sins. Sometimes we do stupid things and um, we have to deal with the consequences. If I'm speeding, you know, God might protect my life and I might not die in an accident. However... I might get a, a speeding ticket. That's a consequence of my actions, right? And, and God allows consequences where punishment is, is not as much of an issue for him. Um, moving along, verse 19. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. David says, consider my enemies, and there are many of them, Lord, and they cruelly hate me. Whew. And David is, true, is, is right about that. He had a lot of enemies, and they fiercely, think of King Saul, fiercely hated him. In verse 20, David refers back to the beginning. Protect me and rescue me, and don't let me be disgraced, for I take refuge in you. Um, in the King James, it says, keep my soul Referring back to what he said at the beginning, I lift my soul up to you, Lord. And David says, keep my soul and deliver me. The very essence of who he is, his meaning, his life, he's asking God to protect um, his life and to protect him from shame. And, uh, and David goes on to declare his trust. For I take my refuge in you. Um, for in King James, it says, for I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you, Lord. Protect me. But I put my trust in you. Um, verse 21, he says, let integrity and uprightness preserve me because my hope is in you. And, and uh, David recognizes that how he lives his life in integrity and uprightness is, preserves him from 
the, the consequences and protects him from his enemies even uh, because God is there, because he has put his hope in the Lord. It seems that there are times that we must acknowledge our own helplessness. We have to acknowledge, David is acknowledging his helplessness here, and then we have to admit that uh, there are those out there that, who actually might want to see our destruction. We might have enemies, and they might be people. Right now, it's our nation, people in our nation. If you're a believer, our nation is not liking you so much. Um, but we all have an enemy of our souls, this Satan, and he's out to destroy us. And so we've got to recognize that we've got to trust in the Lord to protect us from our enemy because we can't always do it for ourselves. We're not smart enough and we're not, we're not aware enough of all that the enemy is trying to do. And we must humbly turn to the Lord and ask him to protect us. If we think that we can go it on our own and we don't need the Lord's help or his protection, we're le- opening ourselves up to whatever the enemy wants to do to us. I have to literally humbly put myself before the Lord and say, God, I cannot protect me. When I, uh, I mentioned that I got fired from a position that years ago, I was, um, before it actually happened, I was walking to work one morning and I was crying out to God and I said, God, how am I going to provide for my family? And, and God says back to me, Tim, you've never provided. It's always been me. It's like, okay, that, that's what I'm saying. It's like, okay, I think that it's me. In reality, it's always been God. And that's a great thing because then I don't have to worry about how much I might fail because God has always taken care of it. Um, and I'm trusting that he will not be, let me be disgraced. Uh, in our previous church, we, uh, I got myself into some trouble with the leadership and eventually we were at, asked to leave. And they, they were talking uh, about me um, and saying some things that, that were not good. And Pastor Paul helped me to kind of work through all of that and and I remember him helping me get to this place where I could say, God, you are the holder of my reputation. And I will not let what they say disgrace me or, hum- or, or break me. And, and I won't respond to it. I chose not to respond to it. I didn't have to defend myself. And uh, over time, what they said went away. And my reputation was in God's hands all the time. Um, and it means, kind of li- it means that we have to choose to live our lives with integrity and uprightness, knowing that we, uh, as we hope and we wait on the Lord, that he will preserve us. David was able to see that um, in the last part of this, the last verse, redeem Israel, O God, out of all of their troubles. David was able to see that all of his troubles were the same as his nation's troubles. And, and I'm thinking about this as I was pondering, you know, what, what David, how can he go from talking about all of his stuff and what's going on with him and, Lord, I trust in you, and, but he recognizes that his nation is troubled and many of the things that are troubling him are the troubles of the nation. And it just, it makes me cry out, Oh, Lord, redeem the United States out of our troubles because many of the troubles that we face now coming into the future are from this nation towards Christians is because of our nations where it's at and the troubles it's going through. It's losing its identity. It's losing its moral standard and its moral uh, foundation. And anything goes. And it cannot tolerate anybody who has any kind of stable moral foundation. And it's going to come against us. Um, Can I have the worship team come on up? David's words reveal a long-term integrity and worship. He, his was a lifestyle of faith and obedience. And because he lived consistently with integrity and trusted God, uh, he could call upon the Lord to deal with him according to God's faithfulness. He, David could cry out and call God to deal with him according to God's faithfulness, not mine, which is probably a really good thing. And you can be sure that God will do the same for all of us as well. And he will treat us according to his faithfulness and his grace and his mercy. These are the things that I've seen in this passage. I don't know that you've seen the same. That's okay. That's okay. But when we go through Psalms, when you're reading Scripture, it's good to go through each verse and it's good to see because because the verses speak to us, the the sections speak to us. As I was reading, each verse had meaning. 
but each there were sections as well and each section had its meaning as well and so as we study scripture this is this is a style that one of the styles there are many ways to study but this is what's been the most effective to me because then it speaks to me it teaches me what david is trying to teach but allows me then to take away what i need to to uh, affect my life so let's pray Father, we offer up our souls, our very souls to you. Who we are and all our hopes and all of our dreams and all of our plans and how we live our life, even in the choices that we make, Lord. And we declare our complete and unwavering trust in you, Lord. Teach us to live according to your ways and not our own. Help us to have ears to hear what it is that you are teaching us. Help us to know with our head but also with our heart that you are faithful and deal with us according to your grace and tender mercy father we ask that you help us to remain humble and that we might learn from you how to live and that we would reverentially fear your holiness lord um, so that we would not easily give in to sin father we need to help you live help we need your help to live according to your ways, that we might dwell in prosperity. We will choose to keep our eyes on you, Lord, no matter what. For, Lord, you are our hope. You are our hope all day long. Lord, help us surrender that which troubles our hearts, and that we, what we, um, so that we won't have to dwell on them ourselves, Lord. Father, we need you to help us live every day with integrity and uprightness. Amen.